Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's been weird. Ah, feels good to hear you say that again. Feels like everything's right in the world. Can we get a group hug? I feel like we need a group hug on this one. No. No. <laughs> I think I think I figured out the the the, the difference, Brian, in, in your your the way because like the, there's the way you look at that scenario, and then Justin and I just have this. All we see is just and again, it's we it, it, it's not to negate one point of view there, but all we see is just this sad, skinny, emaciated guy crying into a camera, and we can't get that image out of our head, you know. Well, take me home. Take me home. <laughs> Lucky for you guys, this is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. And this week I'm talking to you directly, the podcast audience, who I like to call the 99th percentile and not the radio people because I took a week off the radio show just to do some other work and catch up on some things. But this is actually a piece that I really want to present to you because it's an older piece I did about a year and a half ago for a tech show pilot um, that never got picked up. So it only got, the pilot itself only got heard by about 15, 20 people, but I really love this piece. I put a lot of effort into it and I liked it. And a lot of my job in general is to pilot shows and to work on new things and sound design new programs. But the consequence of that is sometimes you make radio that isn't on the radio, which is weird. And so this is one of those pieces. What makes it so appropriate is this actually represents a design problem. And the problem, if you see it as a problem or a design challenge, is how do we get humans on Mars? Uh, there's certainly technological solutions to this problem. There's uh, solutions that involve a lot of willpower and money maybe, but there's also some out of the box thinking that might come into play. Some of the information in the piece is a little old. So it's about a year and a half old. There used to be a constellation project, which was the moon to Mars program that got scrapped by Obama when the world ran out of money. And, uh, I think that's about it, but uh, most of it is still pretty relevant, and uh, I think it's actually quite enjoyable to listen to. So I hope you enjoy it too. So this is the 99% Invisible this week. It's called One Way Ticket to Mars. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. We can get to Mars. That's easy. To break Earth's gravity and hurtle towards the red planet is totally doable. The science fiction part, the tech problem NASA says will take four decades to solve, is how to get back. You can't carry enough fuel for a round trip. It's too heavy. The Mars astronaut will have to make new fuel up there. Literally. Dig a mine on Mars, harvest minerals, whip up a nuclear reactor, assemble rocket parts. Not easy. But if you really want to go to Mars, like now, if you can't possibly wait any longer, James McLean has another plan. I think what we should have is a short program, possibly a 10-year program, like the Apollo program, where we would actually develop the equipment and land one person on Mars, and we would keep that person resupplied. The prime thing that makes this feasible is that you don't plan on bringing this person back. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. All righty. McLean is now an oil and gas pipeline engineer, but for over 20 years he worked for NASA on the shuttle safety systems and the International Space Station. And though he no longer has anything to do with space, he is still a man on a mission. I began to, to be uh, disturbed that uh, there were options as far as space travel to other planets that NASA wasn't uh, considering. I brought up at a, a technical meeting once, a, a guy was giving a presentation about NASA's plans for the future. He raises his hand and says to this guy, why not send one person one way? One person because it cuts down on the weight and supplies to a manageable level, and one way because getting them back is really, really hard. He was just astonished that anyone would uh, would even mention such a thing. It just it sounded uh, almost immoral. But the more I thought about this, the more I I realized that it it was it was actually probably the only way that we could see this thing happen. Uh, you know, in, in our lifetime with the current generation here on Earth, because all of the other schemes that I read about involve developing ex exotic equipment. It's going to take 50 years. You could call it a suicide mission, and many people have. McLean says it's really no more of a suicide mission than the early Vikings making their way to North America. But I think it's really no more of a suicide mission than life itself. Our Mars explorer would be going to live out a life on Mars, a dramatically shortened and unbelievably harsh life, 
but a life nonetheless. Well, it wouldn't. It would not be pleasant. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. It would be, uh, I guess, like living in a submarine. You would probably live in a, a habitat that was covered with with dirt. You know, so you would only go outside occasionally. The, the conditions would be so dangerous. Mars has a poisonous, low-pressure atmosphere, so your spacesuit better work forever. But that's assuming that you can leave your base at all, because Mars is also home to the solar system's largest dust storms that can cover the entire planet for months. And if anything breaks, you're toast. Or more accurately, you're a popsicle, because it can get down to 190 degrees below zero. Then there's the cancer-causing cosmic radiation. Uh, here's the way about a problem. Uh, you better hope not. And it's only a suicide mission from the astronaut's perspective. The problem is that for NASA, it's more of a homicide mission. And that's a little harder to sell to Congress. But explorers get it. Mr. Second Man on the Moon himself, Buzz Aldrin, says the one-way trip is the way to go. Do you really think you'd have trouble getting volunteers for the greatest adventure in history? Right now, the space shuttle has been demonstrated to be an extremely, extremely dangerous uh, vehicle. But uh, people are standing in line to get a chance to fly on the fastest thing on the planet. People are willing to take that risk for the chance of doing something remarkable. This person is going to be more than just somebody to go down in history. Th this person will be, will be like a, uh, an Adam or Eve type figure, a, a legendary figure. Plus, I have to admit, there is something about it that captures the imagination. A doomed, lone explorer in a tiny metal tube sending out daily transmissions back home. It would be poetic and beautiful and kind of inspiring and horrible and macabre. It would be riveting. And it's probably never going to happen. I think that's a non-starter from NASA's point of view. We're not going to send astronauts to Mars without the capability for them to come back. That's Chris McKay, Dr. Killjoy. I'm the deputy program scientist of the Constellation activity, and Constellation is NASA's return to the moon onto Mars human exploration program. So he's actually planning NASA's manned missions to Mars. Well, uh, personally, I, I wouldn't want to go on a one-way mission. <laughs> uh, and also, I like the idea that we bring Mars into the sphere of human activity, which means we go and come and we go and come. I don't see why we have to... A surrender to the technological challenge and say, okay, this is impossible, we can't do it. I think uh, that's a cop-out. What we ought to do is say, well, let's build better rockets. Come on, you guys. Engineers get to work. Uh, I want a round trip. Chris McKay and NASA think we should go to Mars once we're ready to establish a long-term base, something like the Antarctic base, where there are humans there year-round coming and going and doing research. To boldly stay, paraphrasing Star Trek, that becomes the pacing item. But in a sense, uh, what's the rush? Why, why do we need to, to rush to Mars? The author of the one-way plan, James McLean, is 64. So for him, there is a rush. Well, it's, some of these questions would be nice to answer in, in my lifetime. I'd like to know the answers. I'd like to know the answers. People say, well, don't you want to see it in your lifetime? To which I respond, well, I'm not that old. <laughs> Maybe I will live 40 more years. Unlikely, but hey, I go running every day and I don't smoke. The fact that it's in my lifetime or not is really not an important consideration. NASA shouldn't make its decisions based on the lifetime of its current scientists and engineers. And of course, that makes good practical sense. But isn't there something to this idea of a bold Apollo-like 10-year mission to excite the imagination no matter what the cost? Shouldn't we recapture the thrill of the space race? The way you win a race is you exert yourself fully during the race even if it means that after the race you collapse into a blob at the end of the finish line. And that's what we did at Apollo. We exerted enormous effort, we took our best people, pushed them as hard as we could, and we won the race, and then we collapsed at the end of it. But the political context for space exploration now is very different than a race. The Apollo precedent is not the precedent to follow here. And that's a big problem. Apollo was NASA's golden age. When anyone talks about returning NASA to its former glory, that's the model they point to. Except for a small blip of interest during the space camp craze of the 80s, the shuttle era of NASA only grabbed the attention of the world when there was a horrible, horrible tragedy. James McLean asks you to imagine nightly broadcasts from the Mars base. 
disappearing with an astronaut over the edge of a crater five times deeper than the Grand Canyon, hearing stories from the base of a volcano so tall it nearly reaches space itself. And that's a beautiful sight. We'd have front row seats to the greatest and coolest Hail Mary pass in the history of humankind. One man, one way, McLean says, fulfills the bold and inspiring NASA of his youth. But he can feel it and Mars slipping away. They won't even study the option. If they set up a small task force or an office to study this particular option, I believe it would be obvious just from the technical studies that this is the only way it could be done relatively low cost and in a relatively short period of time. All of the other schemes for going to Mars, uh, there's no way it's going to happen anytime in the near future, if forever. Forever is too long, whether we follow the one-way plan or not. Maybe more than out-of-the-box thinking, what we really need is another country to come along and start talking trash and goad us back into the starting blocks of another space race. China, I'm looking at you. I'm Roman Mars with a guide to the modern world. I don't know if there's any footnote to it at the end. I don't think there is. I, it's, a, it's an even worse, because you're thinking like, all right, he's like, oh, look at, for look, this look, week. look at Olympus Mons, that's great. What about year three? What about year four? You got a guy living in a cargo container. You know, everybody goes insane when they do this. People go crazy when they're confined like that. And you're never going to be able to talk to another human being in real time. And like, oh, it'll be poetic. You know, it's like, it sounds horrible. All right. I, I appreciate where the idea of this, and I think that there is a, a, uh, a kernel of this to keep my my part of the podcast in a, in a themed uh, mm-hmm. area that is what what we love about SpaceX it's what we love about this new idea of realizing uh, you know the space race that is today you know that, that are that we can start doing things now instead of thinking about them and I appreciate that element of it that you know how do we get to Mars in the next year? You know, like, and, and is there a, uh, a benefit? What is the benefit to doing it? And I, I totally agree, Brian. And as the, the guy very poetically makes the point, there's no, there will be no shortage of people who want to be that guy. However, to me, I kind of feel like the greater benefit is looking at these problems and solving them and that we are on i don't think that they that what we think of as four decades and five decades out you know, history is littered with us looking at problems that we thought were insurmountable that all of a sudden completely turned around on the gigantic leaps forward of uh you know science and techno- technological innovation so I think the idea of going to Mars and coming back is a worthwhile one that would be amazing to get right and and I don't or at least have a good first draft, you know, and and I think that 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 should that should be the goal and not I mean if somebody goes out I mean no matter what, the first dude to go to Mars is going to be 70% of a death wish no matter what, you know, because it's 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 going to be something that we've never done before and with tremendously high stakes attached to it, you know? I think uh, I, I think what surprised me the most is that you two would have been the last people I would have figured to take the defense of telling other people what their goals ought to be. Like, uh, you guys seem like the type to be here's to the crazy ones, the the people. And, and that's the thing that excites me the most about SpaceX is the opportunity to stop designing by committee. And there's a million good reasons why you should wait. And most of my success in life, what little it is, have all been for times that against the better judgment, I I did the stupid thing or the 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 the. the career suicidal thing, you know? And it's like, and, and yes, this person will go and eventually die on Mars. He will live the rest of his life as the first Martian. And if that's what he wants to do, and if the people who want to fund him want to do it, 
I see no downside to that. Uh, here's, I, here's, I, here's where my merit by, I, I think about every experiment I'm aware of where they've done long-term isolation. I think about every, I think about the tri the problems we've been having putting people in Antarctica. And I think of the reality is there's the, hey, I'm on Mars, fantastic. Then what happens? That's my thing. And if, if, if we had a guy who said, listen, I've got terminally ill cancer. I've only got four years to live. There's no cure for it. Send me to Mars. I'd be like, you know what? Maybe that guy. Maybe that guy. But I might be okay that's, with. That's what I proposed okay. to you. And that wasn't what you were like at all. You never said the guy who's got four years to live terminally ill cancer. I did. I said I said a guy who's terminally ill and, uh, and, and got Steve rolled. Okay, hold on. I think, and the conversation we were having, and this may have just been like that there was where you wanted there to be a period I heard as a comma, because the entire conversation we had on the podcast was about NASA putting this person up there. And if that, I think as a shared, if, if it is an extension of our, of our shared morals, like then I think that there's a part of me that, that idea does not kind of jive. If it's SpaceX, if it's a private company, private dude, and they want to go do it, then, you know, I can still have my questions about how effective it's going to be and whether or not it's going to be a good or a bad thing inspirationally for people, whether people will think of that poetic first, you know, two weeks when he's on Mars or if you know, the things that happen afterward, if things do not, let's say things do not go well, if this person who is being held up on a pedestal is, is shown to be in pain or to, uh, you know, to, to, to have things go less than ideal, uh, I don't know. I mean, I can have my reservations about it, but am I going to say... No, that's horrible. You know, like, you know, like, and no. nothing just like the way. <laughs> Wait, but you like, just did. Look, you just did say no. That's a horrible idea. Well, another thing is like the way we look at like the, when I hear the Apollo program, that's just like I my look opinion, at it, man. I mean, a lot of other people, okay, like the Apollo program, landing on the moon, absolutely inspiring thing. But the fact that this December we'll have not been back to the moon for forty years because we did our goddamn little touchdown dance, we put our flag there, and we said, "Moon done." That hurts. That to me is like that was sort of the death of the space age in a sense was the idea of if we just go put footprints there and put a flag in there and we can say we're done, then we can worry about something else. And that's the idea of the one way thing to Mars. We put a man on Mars. And then it's like and like and forgetting the idea of having to watch this guy slowly go into dementia and go insane in you See, know. But, the, by, but by that logic, would we have been better off without an Apollo program? Would we have Elon Musk now if we had never been to the moon? Well, it depends on what, in exchange for what. I mean, like we we made change. We we had priorities that we decided to do. And and what, would we have been better off if we developed a really reusable spacecraft like we wanted to do? If we if we built the really heavy lift technologies that we wanted to do, maybe we may have had a more sustainable space presence. That's you know there's that's argument has been made. There was a lot of we had a lot of ideas for doing like I mentioned like you know doing the the flybys and stuff. I don't know. I mean, you know, landing on the moon I, I, I was a fantastic. Really, I, I, I find I, I got to think that that we made a significant number of extraordinarily important advances because of the race to go plant a flag and stick your foot down. And, well, I, and that's why but, we have a lot of what we have today. I don't know that that a slow and steady. I, I, I feel this honestly. If man will ever set foot on Mars in my lifetime, it will be with the intention of it being a one-way trip. I honestly feel like there's just no way in the next 60 years we're doing a go and come but, back. But the thing is the techno the 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 guy and when they, you talk about the technological problems of the 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 they talk there there was things that don't jive with what I understand about the the the, the hardest part about Mars missions isn't really the return, it's the sustainability of keeping people alive on Mars. Mars to take off from Mars, you know, you're dealing with one third of the Earth gravity, mm -hmm. and we're already developing right now technologies for like single stage to orbit. That's doable. You send two craft, one that's fuel and a return thing to go into orbit, and then basically you got to get a little bird off of Mars and go back up there. That's not a 40 year problem. To Elon Musk, if we really wanted to do it, that's a 10 year problem. And so by the time you figure out how to get the thing to there and put a guy on there, you could have your return trip. But again, like, uh, but like uh, the three of us are sitting here looking. And by the way, what we're having now is in every way the conversation I was trying to elicit. But imagine the three of us are there and somebody announces, here I go. 
uh, to get in this rocket where I'm going to go and die on Mars. Um, I mean, it sounds like you guys are like, don't go, don't do it. And I'd, I would, I'd say, yeah, don't do it. Wow. No, I'd say Godspeed, man. I would, I would man. say because I would say that, you know, we're, we're so much closer to having the ability to bring you back that I think we, we might damage our, our like, like Apollo may have done. We may, or the, the, this horribly thought out space shuttle damaged our image in a space. We murdered astronauts with this thing. We kept saying, hey, we'll send them up there and we'll, we'll bluff over the safety and all this sort of stuff and we'll, we won't make it as practical of a craft as it should be and we in fact make things worse that's my fear is that when you watch the first guy blow up and you say well if we waited six months later yeah but there's you know, always but, a good reason to wait there's no, always there, a but good there's reason. an acceptable loss we need the to nut me, the idea of saying there is no return to me is not acceptable not even if everyone on board did, wow that's interesting but, I, but again and if you well, show I guess me here's 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 wait, 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 the difference Josh, let me say, if you show me research that shows people in long-term isolation remain stable and happy and don't break down and t break your heart apart i would consider it but every bit of research about this about people who are in long-term isolation they go mentally unstable and my thing is like i could not watch this knowing that this guy is going to be okay with it but knowing that he may think that everybody who thinks they can do this falls apart if you show to me, if you can prove to me to say, hey, some guy can make it 10 years, isolation, totally be cool, I would entertain it, but there's no evidence that I'm aware for that. That was another ominous portent moment when the lightning just struck, struck again. <laughs> I, I guess my, my separation from, I think, where you're at, Brian, is that I, I will always bet on what our look what our outlook of the impossibility of problems is fucking retarded <laughs> like it's just is not is is completely not what how we would we'll look back on it in 30 years and say like wow those were insurmountable uh and i i, I think that especially in this era especially in in the era that we're looking at now when you know space tech is becoming realer cheaper and more and more and more testable uh you know in real world solutions with these private you know uh private companies that um i'm more in love with the idea of let's throw our hat over the wall on coming back and let's make that our our goal because that is a, a key to unlocking the universe whereas somebody going and dying on mars uh, or as as poetic as that trip can be of of the guy putting his his feet down and and just saying that we have we've done it we have reached this part of the galaxy. Um, to me, that it's that's like ten percent of the goal, and and we're not we're not that far away from saying from locking and loading and and actually throwing our hat over the wall and saying let's solve but let's solve this problem let's not do it until we can solve this problem. So uh, now, just in a hypothetical, what if, uh, what if it were uh, ten times cheaper uh, to send a one-way mission with the with a set amount of cargo than it is? Like in terms of like we know how to do it today, we can just we can raise money and we can be starting sending them, you know, in three years versus uh you know round trip ah eh, we got a lot of r and d we got to do all this other stuff um the earliest we can make that happen is ten years from now when we're pretty sure it'll work um now this is obviously exaggerated for discussion's sake, but sure. like it seems to me like if the savings are enough, then it's like go ahead and be that first guy who goes for um uh, who goes for a billion dollars and then we spend a billion dollars you know every twice a year every year like clockwork and then by the time we hit that same point 10 years in the future when maybe we'd be starting our first round trip journey we now have got uh, you know for for slightly more uh, you know for uh, we we now have 20 missions that have sent a continuous stream of colonists and now there's a city on mars that's learning and growing and developing and and mining and 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 by then there's there's 10 years of fuel built up there as well. So now, 10 years down the road, without anybody dying, without anybody having a death sentence, you are able you are now in a better position. 
There's enough time to build a ship down there. Not okay. Really. Well, I mean, number one, that proposition is a much different one than the one that you were describing. Yes, before. it is. It uh, is. Yeah. I mean, I think the big question is, is living on Mars, I mean, like, is, you know, beyond just putting them in a, in a plastic, in a pop matic bubble, uh, you know, uh, is, is having a colony there feasible, you know, if, if, if that's, you know, if, if the, if the, the question is, it, would it be cool to send people to Mars with, with them under the, you know, under the idea that they are trying to set up a, a, a colony and, and we have, uh, you know, a fairly good yeah, I guess idea of what the that means. Is, then, is, like, that's a different story to me. Yeah, the, I, I guess the difference is is what the mindset is when when they head out. But I'll tell you what, man, it's like I'm I'm a fan of free people doing whatever nutty thing they want, and if everyone's on board for it, I don't care how ugly it is. It, it's it I, go. I, well, they, but they're, they're like like I wouldn't want them to pass a law saying this guy can't do that. But does it does it mean that I think it's the best idea in the world? Does it mean that I think that it might be harmful? to the greater goal maybe you know but that's like just my opinion man like I, i'm allowed to have that opinion if they if they if it's their own money and it's not a government sponsored thing where again there's there's a shared cultural morality there of what we think about doing that then right. like i'm not gonna yeah i'm not gonna call the cops on them <laughs> you know there's the the guy who's gonna do like that that stratospheric jump yeah you know, yeah the, the red the, bull the, thing right yeah and and like you know, I look at that, and this guy, he's done his homework, he's done his research, he's, he, he, he has an idea of what he's getting into. Um, he's probably going to stand a better chance than a lot of these guys who are these base jumpers who have done, you know, a, a dozen parachute jumps and then decide they're a base jumper and then splatter their brains across a bridge. And and I guess I look at it, I, I guess... Uh-oh. Man, that's a hell of a face. <laughs> that is a hell of a face. In fact, that looks like the what is wrong with your face. Are, are you back? Me? Yep, yep. No. Lost you there for a second. Uh, we, we heard up to splatter br br brains on base jumping. Yeah, and so I, I guess my thing is like, I just, and again, the thing I keep coming back to is that like, you know, when you look at every experiment we've tried, like, you know, even the silly ones, like what was it, like a, or a Biosphere 2, and how rapidly these things fall apart. The naval experiments on isolation and this stuff, and how rapidly and we take the best, brightest test pilots and stuff, people who are... And that's the thing that scares me, is that it's just this... It, it's not so much some guy like, you know, like fucking Henry Thoreau or what on Walden Pond or something like that on Mars, which is, that's a great notion, but the reality, in my mind, and I could be, again, there may be stuff that, that is counter to this, that you knowing there's this other area, that's the thing that just scares me is just the idea of like was one I don't want to watch a guy suffer but two I don't want to turn the channel so I don't have to watch him right right um I just got a message from Bon I got to check on on the sick kid but uh, I'll give you a group hug now that you gave me the honest discourse that I was hoping for instead of teased me I I'm I I as always I I I don't like it when uh, it goes uh, like when it like as I I kind of read that as far more of a silly discussion than I think like by the time that you had already kind of uh, been like all right I'm just gonna turn my crap off because these guys are being jerks like after you were past that point I'm still like hey we're having fun it's a fun conversation well, and then it's like well, that's why I want to give Brian the last word on that because we were you know when I realized that this is a very serious thing Brian's thought about I wanted him to have the last word on that because yeah I think there was just a mis mis mismatch at that point and then yeah uh, and then by then it was just like all right it's singularity part two Brian do you want to go do you would you do a one-way trip uh, it, it depends on my circumstance. I mean, certainly not now while I have a family and everything, but I could totally see at the age of 77 and, uh, and looking at, you know, like, Hey man, maybe you'll live another 10 whole years. You know, maybe you can sit there and die in that nursing home, or maybe you could go out at age 77, uh, and, and have your job from the moment you land, realize everything's going to be recorded and it is your job 
to be the the guiding voice of generations to come i think that's uh that's about the uh, that, would be, that would be the greatest honor i mean you would be a fucking god for generations to come for for the people if if you pull it off now you might go insane and get all shabby and go you know get crazy space insanity but i'll tell you what between you and me if it gets bad enough i'd i'd you know arrange an oopsie and then go out <laughs> well there's number one there's no way that when the Mars guy's out there and he's absolutely going completely crab pants insane and like everything's going sideways that so there's like, Oh, Oh, I guess uh, there's some solar storm and uh, we've lost our connection to Mars. <laughs> well, I hope he's okay. Well, We're and you know what? Burned. And you know what? And, and it could be that simple. It doesn't have to be watch me go to go to pieces. It has to be like, Oh fuck. It's going to get bad from here on out. And then you, 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 you have your pre-written last communication and you're like, look, I'm going to do my best here. Um, I, I love all you guys. You guys don't need to see the rest of what comes here, but know right. that, that it is a wonderful, delightful place. And you know, <laughs> I've made your bed now, now come join me, you know? And right at that uh, point, and sign it's like, off. there's, there's no way that that doesn't become like what the like what Andrew was talking about about the cosmonauts, the Russian cosmonauts that were like burning up on impact, where it's like it's not you can't just go to YouTube and hear the radio transmissions of them dying, but there's a reason why those stories linger and and they are, you know, they are kind of remembered in the way that they are. And, you know, the the people who who okay missions like that as as much as they were, you know, the bold first steps and they were they were taking the chances and they were they were gods of their age. The people who send those people up there, history does not write them kindly. Uh, it, it, it's always they're always. Well, that's at. why. That's why in my mind it's got to be just a SpaceX, Elon Musk. Like I fucking own this company and I'm gonna do it. It's my money. It's my ship. It's my fucking red planet. Here's here's what I would do. I'd be like, I'd go and I'd be like, I'd get like the first week. I'd be like doing missions and I'd be like, hey, uh, I did some digging. I found diamonds. <laughs> Well, like, what's fucking filled with diamonds? <laughs> diamonds everywhere, guys. Diamonds. I found some tablets, some Martian tablets with some writing. The camera's too blurry. Ah, you, you guys got to come here. You got to check this out. Yes. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna bring. I'm gonna like rearrange it so like we get like uh, some ILM stuff, and it's just like. That next thing you know, like my next transmission, it's just me and Dr. Manhattan in a hot tub, like reenacting <laughs> Notorious B.I.G. videos. Like, it's just going to be like, man, Mars is where the party is. You guys thought I was going to die. Turns out it's awesome. Oh, my God. That's awesome. All, All right. right. Well, go go check yep. on the kid. You got it, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.